Hello, welcome to episode two of season three of the Sub Pop Podcast. I'm Arwen Nix. It's just me today, and I'm going to present to you a little love letter mixtape that we made for our sister brother cousin label, Hardly Art. Hardly Art turned 10 this year, so to begin, here's Sub Pop CEO Megan Jasper explaining why they started Hardly Art. Hardly Art began because people in Sub Pop's A&R department were pitching so many bands and there were only so many spots that we're able to have at one label. And What does that mean? So what that means is that if we put out too many records in a year, we overwork everyone and we cave. People burn out, they fry out, the records aren't worked well, there's not enough attention that we can give to each record. So we always refer to that as there are only so many spots. And we all know what that means when we say it, but there are only so many spots, you know? So how do you create more spots? Well, start a fucking record label. So (laughs) JP was like, we need another label. And at that time, it was not really an outrageous idea because a lot of the other independent labels had partner labels or sister labels or whatever the hell you want to call them, um, imprints. And we thought, well, shit, maybe it's time for us to do that. So how did you guys go from having the conversation to actually doing it? I remember sitting with Jonathan and Tony and we said, okay, let's just get it going in January. And I want to say this is months before. So maybe it was around summertime. And we thought, who do we want to have? Who runs the label? Who works at the label? Um, what's the, is there a partnership with Sub Pop? How does this work? How do we separate it so that it has its own identity? And we determined that we should get someone in who was smart and hungry and determined and disciplined, who could really grow into this. I think we all realized we were talking about Sarah Moody. And so she gladly accepted the position and started Hardly Art, started running it, hired Nick Heliotis, and the two of them became Hardly Art. Why Sarah Moody? Well, Sarah is all of those things that we were talking about before. She has this kind of quiet strength about her. She's super smart. She is very disciplined. Um, She's diligent. She's really reliable. She is incredibly diplomatic. She has a lot of D adjectives. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, um, you know, she seemed hungry to do this and I think you need all of those things so to celebrate Hardly Art today we are celebrating the music of Hardly Art we picked some songs from the label's decade of existing and I had all the people who have ever worked at Hardly Art talk to me about those songs and Tony Kewell, Tony Cool, who's the head of A&R at Sub Pop so you'll be hearing from Tony, Sarah Moody, Matt Colhiti, Jason Baxter, Ruben Mendez, and Nick Heliotis. So here you go. Sub Pop's love letter to Hardly Art. <sighs> taco Cat. We should talk about Taco Cat. <laughs> If I'd had my way, FDP would have been the first single from Lost Time. FDP totally reminds me of old Taco Cat, like Shame Spiral era, because you have that call and response going on, which I think they do so well. And I love Brie in a call and response (laughs) so much. (laughs) <laughs> she really nails it. But it's also just such a kiss-off song. And whenever anyone is able to write a catchy song about having your period, but not only that, the second song, 
Second catchy song about having your period, I think that's an accomplishment. <laughs> If you've ever experienced the first day of your period, you know what they're talking about. <laughs> the Duchess and the Duke. The song's called Mary. I can't imagine anybody not loving that song. A perfect song. You put the blood in my veins and the lips on my face and the tongue And I also was confused. I was like, I can't tell. Is he singing about his mom or a girlfriend? If the lyrics are really weird. And then, and then that started to become fascinating. I was like, oh, that's sort of classic. Uh, that, <laughs> I can't tell if he's singing about his mom or, or his girlfriend. Um, you know, it's like one of those songs that just sounds like you must have been hearing this song your whole life. It sounds immediate. It's ridiculously good. And you gave me two eyes to look with. Now that I'm looking at Looking so strange But you put this pain in my heart And you put this shame in my soul And you wrap your memory around me So I wouldn't die in the rain and the A great design by Black Marble. I remember specifically where I was when I heard it for the first time because I was like, oh, this is a hit song in the hardly art definition of a hit, right? You know, I'm not saying top of the pops. The album mixes had just shown up and I was uh, in New York on business and I immediately like downloaded it and put it on my phone. It was, walking around Manhattan listening to the record and that song came on and I was just, I was like, time froze around me and I was just like, oh my God, he did it. He like wrote the jam. Like, it was just so beautiful sounding um, that I'll never forget where I was when I, when I heard that for the first time. Jacuzzi Boys could possibly be my favorite rock band of all time. I mean, the songs are really simple songs. Like when you strip them down, they're they're pretty simple. But it's all about you know, you know, the lyrics, the voice. Um, and just the overall like structure of the songs, like they're simple but they're perfect. The thing I liked about Heavy Horse is that it's not like their other like rock songs. Like they have a lot of like rock, upbeat like jammers, and this one is kind of a mellow, kind of almost somber song, and it has like a. I want to say like bongos on it that kind of sound like a horse, you know, kind of walking around. And it's a really beautiful song. I think it is. First one on my list is Unnatural Helpers, Sunshine, Pretty Girls. I didn't even know what Hardly Art was before then. Well, number one, I just like think the chorus in that song is great and like the concept behind it, especially living Seattle. Like, I don't know, you get stuck stuck in such a rut in the winter where it's just like days blur together. And I was like a sophomore in college, and 
I was working at the radio station at UW, and and the guy who was the general manager of the station at the time, Omar, was like, "Hey, like, you should check out this band," and I put it on, and I was like, "Oh hell yeah, this is like right up my alley," and it was the first record that like made me aware of Hardly Art. Chris is weird, and the song is uh, "Drunk with the Only Saints I Know." I, 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 they, they are one of my favorite bands of all time, and they will, they have been, and they will remain. I think that forever. feels like such personal music and I know the people that love them like love them so intensely and I definitely feel the same way and I think I think maybe it's because they're one of those bands that um, they're putting their emotions out there and, and their emotions that you have felt also and you maybe you've never been able to like express them in, in such a, a pure manner you know I mean a lot of their songs have these like really great intertwining vocals and guitar parts It's kind of just everything that's great about that band. It's like definitely melancholy uh, and a little bit haunting. But also, like, I don't know, it kind of has a positive message. Like, I, I don't know if this is what the song's about, but I've always imagined that it's about just looking around, like, one of those bars that they spent all their time at, that we all spent all our time at back then, and just thinking, like, these are my people, and this is uh, it's not perfect, but this is my world, and this is as good as I can do in it, you know? We can talk about gazebos. <laughs> I don't like the boys who like me. And the boys I like don't like me back. I don't like the boys who like me. Boys I like. This has a very firm memory attached to it because I don't think it was the first gazebo show by any means, but it was first. It was my first gazebo show, and so they were playing at the Den at Chop Suey. I went kind of not really knowing what to expect, and it was such a great set. But the the song that they were closing with at the time was Boys I Like, and I just remember sitting there wondering is this actually their song? Is this a cover? Because this is so good. And how could this not be a cover? But I've never heard this song before, so it has to be theirs. And that was when I, I was convinced that we had to work with gazebos because it was just too good to let it pass by. It's the perfect combo of catchy and wacky which I think kind of sums up gazebos. But it's also the lyrics combined with Shannon's vocal delivery. That's so great. Where the way that it starts with just a vocal, or I guess two vocals, vocal and harmony, but then it kicks into the whole song and it goes through this whole tirade, but then it just devolves into this super jam session. It's pretty great. Ian Sweet has a song that slays me that's called Cactus Couch. Uh, I only found out later when uh, Jillian Medford, who sings and writes the songs, started doing press that she was having this sort of 
um, extreme mental health episode during the making of the record. And I had no idea like this, that this was going on. So once I knew that she had been having like anxiety blackouts while singing the vocals and stuff, and that like she was doing, dealing with all this heavy shit and like sort of getting her life together during it, I went back and I listened to the record and it is like a completely different album if you know that going in and you're listening to the lyrics. And I feel like that's sort of like one of her strengths as a performer. You know, she went to like Berkeley School of Music and she could sing opera if she wanted, but instead she's in this band where she leaves in all these vocal imperfections and sort of, you know, wails when she wants to wail. And like, I think that's so cool and emotionally expressive. And I just think it's super brave to be somebody speaking super candidly about, you know, mental health and then also making art about it that is accessible to people and really meaningful to other people. This song, there's just like the intensity, like the way that the drums are just like heart poundingly delivered. And then the guitar part will then like shift on a dime and like gets to this like chimier sort of. I still don't completely understand what's happening in this song lyrically, to be honest. Uh, and I've listened to it a bazillion times, but there's, it's this, it's this dirty, awful feeling place where, you know, so called friend. So -called. Not just having a drink, but then keeping it down. <laughs> You're just like, that is such an awesome detail and so just really cements like what this world is that this song lives in. It's so good. The Julie Ruin, with the song Mr. So-and-So, from their record, Hit Me Set. I jump out of my plane in a parachute that says girls roll with a Slater Kitty t-shirt on, and when I land, you know, I'm just going to have to demand a book list. Just, you just write it out by hand and make sure it tells me why feminism needs to exist. Take a picture of me. Oops, I stuck a kiss. Come on, it was just a joke. My girlfriend's a really big fan. Silence. Silence. I'll wear you like a shield to hide me from what I really feel. And criticism, by the way, you play I guess going back to singles, that was one where I was pretty certain that that should be the first single for that record. Because if you're trying to relaunch this band, doing so with a song that basically says fuck you to a whole lot of people that it should be saying fuck you to is a pretty good way to do it. But her vocal delivery on that track is, I mean, you gotta have respect for that. <laughs> and the fact that that's how it starts out and the singing doesn't come in until a little ways into the song after so many people have just been demolished that, I don't know, I just, I loved it. <laughs> it's a great song, what can I say? <laughs> So 
Circle Pit, Slave. It's a really beautiful song. It's, you know, it's like synth heavy. You know, the guitar is there at the end. Um, it's slow, like really slow. The sentiment of it is also kind of like a love song, you know, like I'm your slave. And then there's like the, the talking part at the end, and I'm a huge fan of that kind of thing. Uh, just like, you know, at the moment in the song, people just start like rapping, like, you know, and I don't mean like rapping, like, you know, rhyming and rapping, I mean like just talking. Um, Trains to please. Like it sounded like Twin Peaks, like it sounded like Angelo Badalamente, or however you say his name. It sounded like one of his songs. Talbot Segura hit a note. I, I really don't know if anybody knows this band except for me, so <laughs> it's weird. It's hard to say this, but like, in terms of things that I've been involved in, even tangentially in my life, like this record is like up there with one of the things that I'm most proud of. And again, tangentially involved, like I was like, you know, uh, I was just happy to be there for it. So, sometimes a band is like, they're, they're so unique and so fully formed and perfect when you first encounter them. It just feels like kind of a miracle, uh, and they definitely felt that way. Yeah, just, just weird and different and, you know, very arty but not pretentious. I, I think catchy in a weird way. Um, It's also just wonderful. I mean, the, the way they play their instruments, like, you can't describe it. It's, it's, they're totally different. I don't know how the hell they came up with their sound. I have Hunks and his punks, too young to be in love. Almost feels like a little melancholy because it's like, I don't want to feel what I'm feeling right now. I don't want this to be difficult. I want to keep it easy. It's something universal, I feel like. Probably everybody's gone through something like that. When I saw you, I knew you were the one. The way you looked at me, when it only just begun. I wish I would have known then. What I know now, it wouldn't last too long, but it never does, does it? Colleen Green, Deeper Than Love. I had a very intense experience with that song <laughs> because I got this record was going through a breakup <laughs> so cue a shot of me in a hotel room alone in Poland just listening to Colleen Green on repeat this song that maybe a dozen other people have heard at this point because the record isn't done doesn't even have a sequence yet so it's just me and these demos <laughs> having a whole lot of emotions in a foreign country. (laughs) 
that basically lays out all of her various neuroses about never finding love, even if you did, what's going to happen next? Like, what if you die? What if I die? What does this even mean? And why do I have to worry about all of this? And just going through all these different scenarios and just being so blunt, but also singing in this way where you kind of don't notice until you really start to pay attention to the lyrics and what she's actually saying. The other thing about it is it has this hypnotizing repeating loop in the background of this guitar line and these little cymbal hits and it's just so mesmerizing as a song. To know that she was also feeling that way and that she also had all these worries and thoughts and about this particular topic was kind of revelatory. I don't know. It's it's not that, I mean, she's someone that I think is so chill about everything that you wouldn't presume that she has that going on in her mind. But the fact that she did and was also willing to just put it all out there, but put it out there in this way that is also an incredible song was I don't know, it, uh, it hit home. <laughs> it was a total home run. In search of the perfect Harley Art Mega Mart ad, I am standing in the parking lot of a Walgreens in Seattle, Washington, waiting for a Harley Art fan named Matthew, who I know because I am a regular at this Walgreens. <laughs> Recording. How's it going? Hello. All right, how are you? Good, thanks for doing this. Sure. Are you parked nearby or are you walking somewhere? I'm parked over like two streets over. You want to just walk towards your sure. car? Sure. Okay. So what about Hardly Art currently speaks to you? Uh, it's just the way it kind of represents the music scene here and with so many Seattle bands being on the label and just sort of the inclusiveness of it and the excitement and the progressiveness, like a lot of like feminist bands and that kind of spirit. Do you have some favorites, some label favorites? Well, it's pretty much everything. Um, I mean, it seems like almost every good Seattle band that I like is on Hardly Art, <laughs> especially now that with Dude York. I so, went the wrong way, by the way. But oh, you fun. did? <laughs> Which way are we going? Uh, it's over this way. Okay. <laughs> Have you had any interactions with any of the bands? Well, uh, Jen Champion from S is the one who gave me the tattoo, which was extremely meaningful to me. So let's talk about this tattoo okay. for a second. What is your tattoo of? Uh, it's the Hardly Art logo on my right arm. And why'd you decide to get the Hardly Art logo tattooed on you? The thermals, the song meant a lot to me back in the day. Um, it was my, the first time I got a phone where I could have a ringtone that I chose. I picked that song. It's uh, the best. <laughs> so that's one half of it. What's the other half? Oh, just how much hardly art means to me. Um, I really come to associate it with this time in my life and just loving Seattle as much as I do. It's a huge part of that. And. Um, yeah, the people that I met going to shows, and even the people in the bands who have been so nice to me, just uh, appreciating my fandom and not thinking I'm weird. So if you could say, since this is like a happy birthday love letter mixtape that we're making, do you have any message to the, the, the three main people who run Hardly Art? Uh, I, it's, I guess it's a cliche, but they really changed my life. and um... For the better? <laughs> Very much so. This is going to be turned into a uh, 
This is my version of what a commercial is. Okay. What's the last piece of Hardly Art merchandise, uh, soft good or hard good, that you bought? I don't think I have anything other than records. Does that count? Yeah, records count. Okay. Um, it would have records, been the... like, the most important Okay. Thing. <laughs> is there merch? I, I should look into that. I should be bedecked in Hardly Art stuff. <laughs> There is Hardly Art merch, and you can buy it at hardlyart.com slash hardlyart.com slash shop. That's hard to say. Um, next is a song called Tell Me by S. For me, uh, Cool Choices was a record that we'd been working for a few months, and I was like, this record, you know, like musically, I think it's so cool. I think Chris Wall's production was awesome and just all the intricate guitar parts and everything. I'm not really that much of a lyrics guy. And I knew it was this like super truthful breakup record. But I was like, I can't really relate to that right now. I'm in a happy relationship. <laughs> Cut to like a month before the record comes out and like my entire life falls apart. Like this long term relationship ends disastrously. Uh, but I was lucky in that I had this record that I could listen to all the time and sort of had to be listening to all the time. It, the whole thing just like hit me like a wave all of a sudden. And I was like, I can't believe somebody made a record that is like so what people in that exact context need and like done so perfectly on like every level from like the music to the lyrics especially just being like it can be hard to relate to a lot of art that people make I, I find anyway and when people are able to pull that off even in literature or in cinema or something and not just in music I am so impressed by that because I think that's sort of like the, one of the hardest things that you can pull off um, and I thought Jen did it like better than almost anyone I've ever heard. Arthur and you lion's mouth. This one I'm totally biased because since this came out, I have married you. <laughs> Not you, but you. <laughs> So uh, I definitely have a deep affection for the people uh, involved in the band, which, uh, you know, Arthur and you is Grant and Sonia. The devil got in me oh, I'm definitely a lyrics guy, and I love Grant's lyrics um, so much. And my my fingers and your buttons are like kissing cousins making fabrics come undone. Oh, like such a good line. Like like communicates so much awkwardness uh, and intimacy at the same time in a way that I just I've never heard before. But you know the idea that that's it's like putting your head in a lion's mouth, um, and is like that is like so exactly what falling in love feels like. You know, it's exhilarating, it's dangerous. Um, you know, could end in tragedy. This like Everly Brothers sort of thing happening, but then they are kind of doing this Lee and Nancy, Lee Hazelwood, Nancy Sinatra thing and I think you know Sonia's voice has this like really innocent sweet tone um, and combined with his sort of wary uh, you know delivery and his own vocal I, don't know, I just love it I love everything about it I think they're fantastic so yeah
I was so excited to work with Shannon the Clams. I think the first Clams hit that we had <laughs> was Rip Van Winkle, which is on Dreams in the Rat House, which is the first record that we put out with them. It just kind of happened naturally from working with Punks and His Punks. And so obviously she, Shannon Shaw was involved in that group as well. And so, and I, when I first saw Hunks and His Punks, I was just like, oh my God, who is this woman? And listen to those pipes. I was naturally immediately very charmed. Since then, it's become very clear that the whole band is also very special. I don't think they could exist as another group of people, but a very generic thing to say about songs, because clearly all songs are unique, but I think that they really specialize in mining new territory and really changing their records from album to album. Chastity Belt, time to go home. The verses in that song are like hypnotizing. Like, I feel like Gretchen hits the snare in the the verse like a little bit after the beat intentionally. So it's just like, it like wools you in this like very hypnotizing way. verses in that song especially are like they almost like rock you to sleep but then that up against like sped up choruses and especially like the end of the song they're like clashing against each other but also fit so perfectly together and the bridge of that song everything is beautiful when you're delusional it cuts through and it is really pretty I love that song it's a great song Um, I want to talk about deep time. I'm going to talk about Homebody because it's one of my favorites from their record. And they're another band that's it's kind of similar to Zebos where it's a little bit off kilter, but it's also so precise. Speaking of great vocalists, Jennifer is incredible. Her voice, I think, is one of the best we've put out by far. And I think that they're an underappreciated band for sure, but the people that do know of them and love them are so intense that it kind of makes up for it. That song, Homebody, I don't know how to describe it, but it's this, it's another kind of heartbreaking combo, but heartbreaking in a heartening way, where she's saying, I'm leaving home and I want you to know, I'm leaving home and I want you to notice. But the way that she delivers it is so great, and she has this little coup that happens along with this guitar part, and it all just combines to make this perfect little nugget of a song that I think is... Um, one of the standouts from the record. Lost Animal. Uh, Lost Animal Lose the Baby. Oh, 
I just can't get enough of this song. It's just a go-to song. It has been ever since, you know, Hardly Are put it out. Still put it in mixes all the time. Yeah, and there's some, the melody sort of reminds me of like Tom Petty in a weird way, but they don't sound anything like Tom Petty. But it's just a cool song. It's just a, it's a good summer jam. La Luz. Similar but different to the Duchess and the Duke, where I feel very lucky that we were able to start talking to them so early because we didn't know what they would turn into <laughs> and what they would become as a band. But one of the recordings that I really love from Damp Face is Call Me in the Day. And I especially love the early take on it because it's just so woozy in a way that I don't know that the re-recorded one is. I just, I love the pace of that song, but Shana's vocal delivery is also wonderful and the melody of it is great, but then it also has that wonderful guitar solo that is so classic Shayna and it just that was one of those records where the timing was perfect too because I definitely remember driving around Seattle listening to it in a car and it was just you know driving around Lake Washington in the spring that's what I associate with it is just springtime in the northwest but at night They took this sound that was a throwback and they presented it to a whole new audience that may not be aware of that, the existence of the older version, but it also updated it in a way to make it so much more relevant to a new audience. And it's not like they're regurgitating the same thing from long ago, but they're putting their own stamp on this sound that they truly love. And I don't know, I think Call Me In The Day is a great example of that. Chrysanthemum by the band Haosu. If anything, I think it's like way ahead of its time, but it was not at all what I expected them to do. They're personal to me because it was my first A&R project at the label, and I'd only been there for, uh, I don't know, like a year and a half or something. Sort of like if Orange Juice and Bruce Springsteen were combined. Cool. It's a cool sounding record. That song in particular, and the end of the record, the song Bleak, as like one of the best jam outs I've ever heard. It just like goes and goes. And not in that like wanky, you know, dude rock band way. In that like really cool like early 90s Sonic Youth way. Song called Old Hound. I'll be your... I think there's a there's a thing that happens, and I don't know what it is, but when something goes from being really good to like actually like transcendent, you know. And there's a moment in that song. It's kind of it's funny because it's not it's almost like a idea more than a song. It's like a kind of one of those short 
repetitive and his layers and then there's this part towards the end where a piano comes in and uh it's just one of those like moments that uh amazes you i had this feeling a lot when i was working at hardware when you're just amazed by what uh someone that you know is doing um but i felt that especially strong with that band because uh kevin the singer and the guy who wrote the song is, is like one of my best friends and we've been friends for years by the time we worked together on that stuff and uh, it still amazes me that that stuff came out of him, you know? Um. <laughs> Uh, next is Gem Club Braid. And I love Gem Club so much. Eyes cast into the night. They affect me in a way that I've not really experienced since like early Low and Red House Painters records. Um, the songs are very, you know, methodically layered and they evolve very slowly, generally speaking, over long periods of time. Like a lot of their songs are five minutes plus. I think this one is over five minutes as well. Before you even know what the first sentence of the song is, just there have communicated so effectively in the arrangement, the melody, the tone of his voice, and the, there's three-part harmony in this song. Um, there, it immediately, for me, evokes a beautiful sense of loss. feels like you're breaking up or someone has passed um, and you're heart sick but so grateful to have known them. That very specific, short period of time when you can find that real delicate balance of understanding how brief life is, um, but how precious every second of that life is. You know, it's just, it feels like the most important thing you can understand, you know? I don't know, to me, it's like one of those like really grasping, like how tragic this situation is but how lucky we are to even have that just amazing like my i get a pit in my stomach from the first notes Thanks so much for listening. We have a Spotify playlist of all these songs, and you can find show notes and additional info at subpop.fm. You can follow us on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And if you have a song, a sub pop song or a hardly art song that you want to tell us a story about why you love it, if it's the baseline or you were in the middle of a breakup when you heard it and it helped you, send us a voice memo. You can email us at podcast at subpop.com. Anything else that you want to say to Team Hardly Art to celebrate their 10th birthday? Good fucking job, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Great.
It's impossible to not talk about these songs and realize just how many relate to breakups. (laughs) 